Thank you very much for your interest in the work that has been done by the European Investment Bank in 2014 and on what we plan to do in 2015 and the following years. And it's certainly exciting times. Uh, there will be the opportunity to, to put all kinds of questions. And uh, if I think I need it, and that probably will be the case, then I'm surrounded by lots of expertise of the bank, which is available also for more specific questions. It's an honor and pleasure for me to be here today and to report to you what the EIB Group, that is the European Investment Bank, and our subsidiary, the European Investment Fund, have done and will continue to do to help support Europe's economy. For the first time since 2007, the economies of all member states of the European Union, and I hope that will be hold true for Greece as well, are expected to grow again this year. But Europe is still held back by a weak investment and high unemployment causing widespread social hardship. This is why the EIB Group put all its effort into overcoming financial bottleneck, financing bottlenecks. We need to enhance growth, we need to boost employment in Europe, but we must do so in a durable, sustainable way if we want to bring real benefits to welfare of European citizens. And benefits for citizens are what we are about. As the EU Bank, we know that our funding is a means to an end. We provide funding for viable projects where it makes a difference. Unlike a commercial bank, our objective is not profit, although we are running the shop very economically, economically successfully. Our objective is economic and societal outcomes. So let me start by saying that our funding in 2014 delivered concrete benefits to Europe's citizens and societies. We provided financing for companies that created and preserved 3.9 million jobs. We supported 290,000 businesses, mainly SMEs and mid-caps, the backbone of our economies. As a result of projects financed by the EU Bank, 4.4 million new digital connections now give households and businesses better access to high-speed broadband. Four million tons of CO2 emissions were avoided thanks to the impact of EIB-funded projects. This is roughly equivalent to taking two million cars off the road. Furthermore, we helped build or modernize new hospitals where 18 million EU citizens profited from improved healthcare facilities. I could go on and on for other sectors, energy savings, improvement in traffic, support for students, but I only wanted to illustrate the difference we are making for the benefit of citizens and businesses. The difference, because we have to move a little bit from the input orientation, so, hundred, so many hundred billions invested into this or that, to output orientation, to impact. What does it mean for the citizens at the end of the day? We achieved all this by focusing on key priorities which tally with those of the member states and of the EU as a whole. Strategic infrastructure with 20.6 billion euros, climate action 19.1, innovation and skills 14.7, and SMEs and mid-caps with a record figure of 25.5 billion euros. As last year, our SME support was the single largest policy contribution of the EIB group because SMEs are where, they are where most Europeans work and SMEs had the biggest problem in, it, in accessing the uh, capital markets or the funding markets. It is important to note that we take account of policy priorities in everything we do and we try to address as many of our priority objectives as we can with each project. In other words, these figures are not a simple sum of different funding pots, each dedicated to one priority in isolation. On the contrary, multiple policy goals inform everything we do. For example, funding for youth employment remains a key concern for all European governments, the unions, institutions, and of course, the EU Bank. You might remember the youth unemployment summits we had in Berlin and in Paris and later in Rome, uh, beginning in 2013. Uh, we can say we have delivered on our promises there. As a matter of fact, we have overshot the targets considerably. We have focused on funding projects with the potential to create jobs for young people under a number of activities, most prominently funding for SMEs and for innovation and skills. In 2014, 
We have directed over 13 billion euros towards projects capable of generating more than 500,000 jobs for youth. In 2014, the total EIB group financing amounted to 80.3 billion euro. EIB, the bank, alone lent nearly 77 billion euro, around 5 billion more than in 2013. And we continued to give special attention to the countries currently most in need of investment. We lent 11.9 billion to Spain, 10.9 billion to Italy, 1.6 billion to Greece, and 1.3 billion to Portugal. To be quite clear, and this is important also for the discussion we will have in the next months and weeks of the Juncker Plan, we do not apply country quotas. Our business model is based and will continue to be based on a well-balanced portfolio across the entire Un European Union and on the basis of the rule that every project that we finance will be financed because of its merits. We are the financing arm of the EU28, and we will remain focused on viable projects within all 28 EU member states. But even when all eyes are on growth and jobs within the European Union, this does not mean that the EIB is retreating from the rest of the world. Any disengagement from the rest of the world, in particular in our neighborhoods, would be a loss for Europe. In these difficult and volatile times, signaling a retreat from engagement across the world could bring truly tragic consequences. We have always acted globally, and we will continue to do so. In 2014, the bank provided loans of 8 billion euros to projects outside Europe. That's roughly 10% of our annual lending volume. Let me say a few words specifically on Ukraine. You might remember the press conference I had here last year. And immediately before that press conference, we took the decision, one stair up here in this building, to suspend all business in Ukraine after the atrocities on the Maidan. We said at that time we cannot continue to do business as usual as long as people are being slaughtered on the Maidan. A few days later, the situation in Ukraine changed, and the Foreign Affairs Council and the European Council asked us to resume business and strengthen business. At that time, we agreed with the Council to double our proposed or planned investment in Ukraine from 1.5 billion to 3 billion over the next three years. We have delivered in the first year with roughly 1 billion, and we intend to continue to do so over the next two years. The bank stands ready to sign more than 1 billion euros in additional loans in Ukraine for this year as part of the 3 billion package. Ladies and gentlemen, let me now put these large figures in a bit of historical context. Since its beginning, EIB lending has increased with each enlargement round, as you can see. Of course, we began as a bank of the six, and the bank was founded within and being an integral part of the Treaty of Rome. We steadily supported Europe as it grew into place, into a place of prosperity for more and more European citizens. And at the bank, we are proud of this history. We delivered over years of momentous, sometimes dramatic change for the Union, the continent, and the whole world, and we never took it for granted as no one should. Our history, is not a history of plastic coasting, but of change and challenging successful adaptation to change. Then came the most profound financial crisis in our generation. The magnitude of turbulence the crisis brought is unparalleled in the bank's history. It challenged us both as a public body and in particular as a public body committed to pursuing public policy objectives and as a financial institution operating under the turmoil facing all banks. The bank responded decisively. It provided a veritable hockey stick of counter-cyclical lending, in particular to member states which were hit hardest by the crisis. Since the beginning of the crisis, the bank made available loans worth nearly 500 billion euro in total. And since we normally <clears throat> roughly finance one third of a project, that means mobilizing some 1.5 trillion euro of investment in Europe. In the grand scheme, 
of uh, 15 trillion economy. This was clearly not the panacea to solve all of Europe's woes, but it was and it is a significant contribution to Europe's response to the crisis, a strong complement to work done by the member states and by our European partners, ECB, ESM, and the European Commission. In particular, we secured access to long-term financing for small and medium-sized businesses, which, as I said, are the backbone of our economy and which are often hit hardest. Nobody in the beginning of the work of the European Bank in the mid-50s and late-50s when finally the Treaty of Rome went into place would have thought that one day lending for SMEs would be the biggest part of all lending activities. But it's an adaptation to reality. And the reality is that still today, not only because of differentiation of markets, the access to finance for SME is one of the biggest problems we face. While it could, the EU bank increased its lending on the basis of its own reserves. When this was no longer enough, it received a capital increase from EU governments that allowed it to again end, increase its funding volume without compromising its business model. Without that capital injection decided two and a half years ago, the EU bank would not have been able to uphold these exceptional lending levels. As a matter of fact, three years ago, we had to see that after the first wave of the financial crisis and the great contribution the bank did in mitigating the crisis, it would have been necessary to turn pro-cyclical. And that, of course, was something that was neither desirable nor politically, politically acceptable. So the member states took the decision to beef up the balance sheet of the bank by injecting cash. Well, injecting cash at the end of 2012, short before Christmas, going to national parliaments for supplementary budgets, that was not an easy deal. And it had to be done by all of them, 27 at that time, plus Croatia. They all did it, and it was uh, quite an effort, and now, as we can see, quite a success. Because in 2012, when they decided the capital increase, we promised our shareholders, the governments of the EU, to provide around 60 billion euros of additional lending based on the increase in our paid-in capital of 10 billion euros. We know that the EIB typically funds a third of project costs in each case, and that 60 billion additional lending and guarantees correspond to around 180 billion additional total investment if we include contribution from third parties, if we really manage to mobilize private funds for the financing of projects that we propose. In other words, the benefit for the economy of the capital injections is not 60 billion, but 180 billion. You can imagine that after I've made that promise to the European Council and to ECOFIN, uh, we at the bank sometimes had some uh, sleepless nights because that was, was a big word. Today I'm delighted to say that we will fulfill our promise of 180 billion additional investment in Europe by the end of 2015, already in March of this year, nine months ahead of schedule. And I'd like to thank all my colleagues at the bank and the EIF for the great job they have done and they are doing. But as I said in the beginning, Financing is a means to an end, and as the EU, EU is long-term lender, we need to look beyond tomorrow and take the long view. The objective is to support growth and jobs in Europe in a durable, sustainable way, and this requires Europe to be and remain or become again competitive in the global economy. Ladies and gentlemen, we have been in crisis mode in the European Union now for seven years and somehow lost a little bit of track what is happening in the world around us and where we might have lost competitive edges or where we still have huge gaps, not only in investment, everybody talks about the investment gap, but also in innovation. We produced a study which, became, which came to alarming results. Just to give you some figures about the investment we would need to mobilize in order not to fall behind our competitors. According to this study, which, by the way, is available to you if you're interested, both online and in print, Europe should invest an additional 130 billion a year in R&D to meet the EU's own target of 3% of GDP for the knowledge economy. Europe should invest 100 billion yearly to upgrade energy networks to integrate renewables, improve efficiency, and ensure security of supply. Europe should 
Invest 50 billion yearly to upgrade transport networks to reduce congestion costs and trade bottlenecks. And Europe should invest 55 billion to reach the EU's digital agenda standards in broadband and data center cap capacity. And all these figures I have mentioned are additional figures, additional to what is already foreseen in national or EU budgets or uh, by companies. Clearly, most of the money to overcome the investment gap and the innovation gap must come from private capital. This is not just due to the budgetary constraints of member states. It is pivotal because private capital should be put to work in a way that fosters growth, fosters innovation, fosters competitiveness. And of course, that reflects very well the business model of the bank anyway. We are there in order to mobilize private funds for public purposes. And uh, this is the reason why uh, Mr. Juncker has come to the bank in order to discuss this uh, new plan which he proposed in December in the European Parliament with us. Tapping private funds shouldn't be a problem. The capital is there. That's the big difference to the situation we had three years ago when we went for the capital increase. There is ample liquidity in the system. As a matter of fact, Europe has become a net lender of capital to the rest of the world. Also, the need for investment is there, obviously. The task force of the member states, which we jointly led with the European Commission, produced a list of 2,000 potential projects globally worth more than 1.3 trillion euros. It is a diverse list, and projects need to be looked at case by case. And there are many projects on, these li on this list which will never see the light of day. But the lack of demand has shown to be a myth. Enough projects are there. So where is the problem? Why is the money not going to projects in Europe? In a nutshell, because of a general lack of confidence, because of bureaucracy and legislation-induced bottlenecks and obstacles, because investments are perceived to be too risky and too uncertain. And this brings a market failure, not in liquidity, but in risk-bearing, in, in particular at a time when banks are still forced to deleverage in order to fulfill all the criteria of the new regulation of the banking markets. So we need a bridge between ample liquidity on one side and investment opportunities on the other. And this is precisely what the EU bank has started to do and what we are going to do even more, provide this bridge. We have increased the number of projects, uh, sorry, we have increased the number of products that address projects with higher risk profiles. We have added to our toolbox some new and innovative products in order to address market gaps, open up to new client groups, and reflect changing policy priorities and member states' financing requirements. These products range, uh, range from risk finance for innovation under Innofin to mid-cap loans, from innovative climate funds to trade finance. And we have put more work into advising and helping project promoters match financial offers. But we need to do more. We need a bridge at a significant bigger scale to better connect liquidity and investment opportunities in Europe. And at a time when monetary impulses, impulses from monetary policy obviously do not reach the real economy anymore, this is a key role that an investment bank, a public investment bank, needs to play. This is why we were thrilled to work in partnership with uh, Jean-Claude Juncker and the EU Commission and prepare the Investment Initiative for Europe proposed by the new President of the Commission in the European Parliament in December. Before I go into more detail about EFSI, let me emphasize one thing. The new fund is only one part of a big jigsaw. Alone, it will not solve the problem. First and foremost, and that's sometimes forget because we are so thrilled by the new work that's coming out to us. The EU Bank Group, the EIB Group, must continue to do its regular job. Our baseline activity, bringing loans worth around 50 billion euro into the European economy each year, is the foundation on which the new initiative rests. Neither we at the bank nor anybody else should this foundation to take this foundation for granted. If the business model behind it should be compromised, for whatever reason, the bulk of today's creative, effective, adaptive lending tools in Europe will be compromised. Critically, we need decisive action on the regulatory front at national 
and EU-wide levels to create an environment more conducive to private investment. We need to make Europe much more business friendly than it is today. And we need to enhance technical assistance, which is essential to make sure that funds are used effectively and channeled only to sound and economically viable projects in sectors that are critical to Europe's competitiveness. Let me now turn to EFSI. The so-called new fund will be set up within the EU bank and it will be an integral part of the bank. Its mission is to provide catalytic funding and to reduce, reduce the risk inherent in viable necessary projects that are currently just on the wrong side of the risk equation for potential investors. In other words, the fund will reduce the risk involved in existing strategic value-added viable investment opportunities and attract private capital to strategic projects which would otherwise have been delayed or never get, got off the ground. To achieve this, EFSI will be endowed initially with a 16 billion EU guarantee from the Commission and 5 billion euros from EIB's own resources. By reducing risk, EFSI funds will help mobilize at least 315 billion in private and public investment over three years. With EFSI, we will be able to use our know-how and experience in close partnership with the Commission to respond to Europe's market failure. We are sending a strong signal to strengthen confidence and to improve the competitiveness of Europe's economy. Ladies and gentlemen, the investment initiative presented by Mr. Juncker has often been criticized for relying on an unrealistic multiplier. That is not correct. And it's certainly not rocket science when I counter that argument. In fact, EFSI is no different in nature from what the EIB group delivers in other areas of its activity anyway. The 15-fold multiplier is considerably more conservative than the 18-fold multiplier we predicted when we received the capital injection three years ago and it now turns out to be much too modest at the end of the year. If we would just continue the way we have done the first 26 months, we would probably end up at a, certainly end up with a multiplier far beyond 20. EFSI will use instruments which are familiar to the bank, high-risk loans, guarantees, subordinated mezzanine debt, and equity-like or equity -like in investments. Each of these products has a different effect in mobilizing further sources of funding, but the common effect is that they serve as the buffer to absorb risk so others can provide funding while taking reduced risks. We are not taking away the risk from the other investors. We are mitigating the risk. Thus, we do not crowd investors, but on the contrary, we pave the way for private capital, which otherwise would be reluctant to invest in projects in Europe. As you can see, EFSI-funded investment will amount to around 105 billion on a yearly basis until 2017. This will represent around a third of total EIB group impact in mobilizing investment across Europe. Like all other parts of the EIB group, EFSI will only list projects to fund after doing due diligence on each. The, EU group, uh, the EIB group has announced that it will look at starting funding operations for EFSI projects straight away without waiting for the completion of the legislative process setting up, at the, by setting up the fund. But due diligence is not yet complete, particularly in the case of projects with higher risk profiles. It is more complex and takes longer than for others. I don't want to go into details, but this is the big challenge we have to meet now. For Council, European Council and ECOFIN, it was decisive that the EU Bank was able to say from the beginning even if the legislative and regulatory process will take a couple of months, hopefully until June, but in the negative case, maybe until the second half of the year, the EIB bank will practically pre-finance or warehouse, in other words, to go ahead with projects of which we believe that they will be drawn under the Juncker plan umbrella once the regulation is set. So this is very attractive. Uh, to, for our political masters to tell them that we are working on the EFSI projects already now. Ladies and gentlemen, the EU bank has a strong record of putting money to work. We promised member states to achieve the additional 180 billion 
when they raise the capital, and we are delivering. Now with EFSI, we are adding to our capacity to support and deliver viable projects with a higher risk profile and significant sustainable economic benefits. This does not only improve our support to the European economy, it also makes a very important paradigm shift in the use of limited public funds. This is maybe politically the most important and most sensitive move because the European Commission has proposed to the Member States and to Parliament to shift budgetary resources from grants and subsidies to loans and guarantees. This is a major breakthrough. It has been preceded by a couple of instruments that we had developed together in the last financial perspective with uh, research financing and risk sharing uh, financing, but it's now going to take place on a big scale. And the reason, of course, is that this is the best way to leverage private capital and multiply the effect of the initial funding. Together with continuing efforts by member states and the EU to introduce structural reforms and to modernize regulation, mobilizing capital in the way the Juncker Plan intends will generate the necessary confidence to address the economic challenges that Europe faces and set the Union on the right track to recover global competitiveness because with an end of the crisis, at least in sight, competitiveness is now the name of the game if we Europeans want to preserve our status and improve it in the global competition. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, President. Um, we will now go to questions. Uh, the slides that the President used for this presentation are available on the website. You can find them there. Um, uh, questions will be addressed at the to the President and uh, uh, we, he may decide to call in uh, others at the table, uh, Secretary General uh, Alfonso Carajeta or Director General of Operations, Klaus Trömmel, or other members of the Management Committee of the Bank or Senior Management uh, that are, are in the room. I would ask you please to identify you uh, clearly at the beginning of each, uh, of each question. And, uh, we can open straight away. There's a question at the very back there, followed by here. Thanks very much, Rebecca Christie from Bloomberg. A uh, couple of clarifications. You mentioned 100 billion euros a year might be needed for investment in energy, and you threw out some numbers also for digital sector. Where are those numbers coming from? Also, could you give us your borrowing estimates for 2015 and any other years that you have information for? And finally, on the list of potential projects for the, the FC program, we've heard from other places that the EIB has done some preliminary work on the list and come up with an idea that maybe a, a quarter or a third of the projects on that list are, are viable without naming specifics. Is that right, or are we misunderstanding? What are, what are they talking about there? Thank you. Well, the, the impact figures or the, 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 the need, uh, investment needs in order to, uh, to meet the targets come, that comes from a simple comparison between the objectives set by the European Council as far as competitiveness is concerned, as far as broadband coverage is concerned, as far as uh, if energy transmission is concerned, with the budgetary provisions in the Member States and the European Union. And there is this huge gap between what is, what is obviously the, the political wish and what is going to be possible in view of budgetary uh, means provided in national and European budgets. And these uh, gaps are just dramatic. And if we have now arrived at, uh, generally, at roughly 2% of GDP for the knowledge economy, and the target set by the European Council is 3%, then we need to do something. And similar calculations are true for the other areas I mentioned. Uh, and this has uh, led us to the, the, these estimates which are pretty well based and uh, I can only offer you the study that uh, we have made at the beginning of last year and we have just published it. It's on the website but you can have it in print as well and there you can see the deductions we have calculated in arriving at, at these figures. Second question, borrowing at this, of this, in this year uh, will be, it was, on, yeah, it's on there. Uh, it's a little bit over 60 billion. This oscillates from year to year. Uh, over the last uh, seven years, borrowing always, or our funding needs, uh, always oscillated between 80 and 60 billion. 
This has to do with repayments to, which take place. Some years we do some pre-funding at the end of the year in order to be better off at the beginning of the next year. So these figures are oscillating. It does not indicate any uh, dramatic change in, in the business behavior. So this year we believe it's going to be a little bit above 60, 61, 62. But there might be considerably more if at the end of the year our uh, treasury of, is of the opinion that it's better to do some, some pre-funding at the end of 2015 instead of borrowing early in 2016. So it is not as pre precise as lending figures can be predicted. And on the list, no, we cannot confirm uh, a certain percentage of this being uh, eligible or not. We have to discuss that project by project. Uh, we know that the, the way this, 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 this list came about uh, was definitely arbitrary and uh, for some also big temptation to put projects on that list uh, which otherwise would not be financed and uh, nice try. Uh, some of them will never see the, the light of day as I've said. On the other side, we are encouraged because we see so many promising projects on that list and we have uh, told the finance ministers that on that basis, we can now go into the scrutiny. But it's, it's, it's a breathtaking and, and very, very laborious thing to do because you have to be fair and uh, precise on each and every project. And uh, more than 2,000 of these projects is a huge lot of work. I would not dare to give a prediction on percentages. There's a question there. Anna Swayewska, Polish Daily Rzeczpospolita. I have two questions on uh, EFSI. You said about this pre-financing, you know, the already working on the projects before the legislation is in place in order, you know, to, to speed, uh, speed, speed out the whole process. But I don't quite understand it. Because the structure, the management structure is in place only when the legislation is in place. So the management board and the investment committee could be in place only when the legislation is approved. So how could you do any, any, any pre-selection or any, any, any al analysis on what kind of priorities, on what kind of, you know, what kind of uh, selection criteria? And my second question is uh, about the capital of uh, EFSI from the latest uh, uh, council of, uh, from, from the latest ECOFIN meeting, I understood that the idea of having member states as, as participants, it's, it's no longer valid, but perhaps there will be like the state banks, uh, the guarantee banks that could join on, on the kind of investment platforms. Could you explain how, how could it work? Thank you. Thank you very much. Two very relevant questions. Uh, number one, management. The management for the new project is fully in place because all these projects will be managed by the banks and the funds management are experts in the bank. What we need additionally, and this will be the outcome of the legislative process, of the reg regulatory process, and the agreement between the bank and the commission, is going to be the setup of the investment committee, or I prefer to call it guarantee committee, because the remit of that committee is not to check the projects. That will be done by the normal project selection and scrutiny process in the bank. The role of that, of the remit of that committee is to check the eligibility of a project for an EU guarantee, for a budget guarantee. And this can be done indeed only once this uh, guarantee committee has been set up after the legislation. Now we pre-finance, we, we begin with these projects on the basis of the assumption that the regulation will come into place. And, and until it is in place, we take it on our own shoulders, that is, we put it on the own resource of the bank and uh, assume that, and we are very confident, that once the regulation is in place, in place the uh, investment or the guarantee committee will sort of uh, adopt these uh, uh, projects. Uh, now on the uh, second, so the, the main answer is, no, the, the management structures are in place. We, we do not need, we do, we do need, need more people. There's no question. It's going to be a huge increase in the, in the business and the work of, of the bank because we are going to go into more risky, more granular, uh, smaller projects. So it takes per project more labor investment into, into this. So this is true. That we need. We need more. 
but we need not uh, need the management, new management structures. Okay. The new so-called management structures are referring only to the guarantee question. On the, um, on the national promotional banks, or in other countries, they are, might have a different name, but uh, in several countries we have big partners in, with national promotional banks. We intend to, and we are encouraged by the member states, to significantly increase and intensify our cooperation with national promotional banks. And they are very interested in it. I just uh, had intensive talks with KFW in Germany, but the same is true for CDC in, 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 in France, and CDP in, in Paris, BHK in, uh, in, in Poland. <laughs> we have practically in, in all bigger member states, uh, almost all bigger member states, uh, promotional banks which are interested in that. And uh, we, are, we are seeing promotional banks even being newly founded in some member states. Uh, we just uh, participate in that exercise in, in uh, Ireland and in, in Greece, so uh, more will come. And we, we, on the other hand, we need these promotional banks because we, when we go more and closer to the clients, uh, then we need the expertise and the knowledge of our colleagues in the national promotional banks and the national banks in general. Because you must always see that the EU bank is very lean in comparison to other IFIs. With a business, with a balance sheet of 450 billion euros, which is almost triple the balance sheet of the World Bank Group, we only have a little over 2,000 employees, full-time equivalent, while the uh, World Bank has 18,000 people. So we are very lean, so we must rely upon partners and that is, of course, an offer from the member states to say, uh, if we organize a, an investment platform on, in a country or a region, uh, then we can better mobilize private funds for projects in these regions with the help of national promotional banks. This is on a, on a very good way. I think we will see different patterns of cooperation in the different regions of Europe, but uh, we intend to be very proactive on this. Hello, Mr. Hoya. This is Chris Burns with uh, Euro News. Uh, first question is about the, the multiplier effect of the seed money that you would provide that would encourage more private investment. And I think during your, your talk, you talked about how you, uh, typically you provide about a third of the, th of the seed money. So that's a three times multiplier effect. But what has been talked about up to now is that the Juncker plan would provide about 35 billion, if I'm not mistaken, that would be multiplied into 315 billion. That's that's more than nine times the figure, and the figure that you showed here with 60 billion, uh, that's about five times. Um, how optimistic are you that you could actually generate that much pub uh, private investment with that little seed money, relatively compared to uh, uh, other? Uh, 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 past performance. Um, second of all, you said that you, you made a very big caveat about how successful this can all be. Uh, this is obviously, you are the point man for this pro project, really, it's very important. How important is reform and what kind of reforms would you like to see done for this Juncker plan to actually work? Because you're going to be the bridge, but not indefinitely. Um, and just third is, Greece, uh, very important day today. Greece has to come forward pledging its reforms. That's a bit related to that. And is there any way that the EIB can further facilitate Greece's uh, exit from its plight? Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, on, on seed money and uh, the proportion to, uh, to impact, uh, we are much more modest than we were with the capital increase. And there we could say, on, on the basis of an additional 10 billion euros cash injection in the bank, we are able to mobilize uh, bond buyers to buy our bonds in order to allow us to lend more. And at the same time, at the same time, that's the difference between leverage and a multiplier. At the same time, we know that we only finance one third, roughly. So if you put these together, then you arrive at Three points, three times six, and that is 18 in the case of the of the uh, capital increase. And we now assume, uh, on a more modest uh, base, uh, 3.5, and that will be 15. 
there is no precision in that that uh, might uh, one might be tempted to assume when you see the precise figure of 315, which Mr. Juncker has announced in the European Parliament. That looks a little bit like Tudor precision, uh, of course. Uh, but it is a simple multiplication of uh, uh, 21 by 5, or times 5, leaving you at 105, and over three years, that's 315. This is the, the entire logic behind it. I consider this assumption as realistic. Uh, we considered the 18 as realistic, but we were afraid that we would miss it, that we would stay be below. At the end of the day, we are now far beyond 20. So uh, maybe we can produce a positive surprise with the 15 as well. So I'm, I'm quite re reassured. But that brings me to your second question. Uh, if, we, if we ask our potential and factual investors, what are the <coughs> biggest uh, concerns you have, or what are the biggest obstacles for you to invest more in Europe? They come with regulation, and they come with bureaucracy and red tape. So to put it in a picture, sometimes I believe we should not only on a day-to-day, hour-by-hour basis, cooperate very closely with uh, Mr. Katainen and Mr. Dombrovskis and Mr. Moscovici. We should at the same time cooperate much, much more closely with Mrs. Georgieva and Mr. Timmermans because they will have the burden of uh, reforming the budget and of re reducing and cutting red tape. This is key and that is not only key on the European level, that is also key in the, in the member states. So for us, reform policies or growth policies have never been an alternative. For us, they always belong closely together. And also in the context of the Juncker plan, we can only say the Juncker plan will run into a vacuum if it is not accompanied by ambitious reform processes in the member states and in the Union. Third issue on Greece. Uh, we are very proud of our activities in Greece. We have been there uh, for a very long time. Um, let me say a personal word on this. I used to live for a while in Greece as a high school student. And that time Greece was a bloody dictatorship. And I'm so proud to see this country moving into democracy, the state of the rule of law, becoming a member of the European Union and a member of the Eurogroup. So I have really personal engagement there. And I must say this bank was, since the entry of Greece into the U European communities, active there. We have been active before the crisis. We are the ones, underlined ones, who stayed during the crisis. And we intend to stay after the crisis. And we hope from the bottom of my heart that uh, the process that has been given a new chance on Friday uh, will lead to tangible results uh, over the next uh, four months. And first, of course, uh, during the next uh, 24 hours until the agreement has been done. Uh, we can, our exposure to Greece is, is, is quite significant. I think I have a f some figures here which might be of interest uh, for you. The overall uh, exposure uh, of the bank in, in Greece is 16.9 billion euros. And that means 9.4% of GDP of Greece. So this is a very, very, very high number. It is uh, only topped by, by Hungary, uh, Slovenia, Portugal, and Cyprus. So uh, that shows also that our concentration of the country's hardest hit by the crisis is, uh, is for that there is written proof. Can we do more? Uh, we have heard. Finance Minister Varoufakis uh, speculating about this. One has to be clear, if there are good projects, viable, economically viable and sustainable projects, we are ready to check it. But uh, this is the problem also in Greece, that uh, we need good projects. Everything we finance is going to be refinanced by the capital markets around the world. And that means we, have, we need the trust of the investors. And therefore, it is absolutely a no-go area for this bank to go into weak projects. This rule must be maintained. This is the basis for everything we do. And therefore, we are ready to address the issue. But so far, I don't see uh, more projects. But the volume is already breathtaking. Over the last couple of years, it has exploded. Are there more questions? Yes, here. Hello. Go ahead. Hi. 
I'm Stan Wout, a journalist for uh, Belgian business television, Canal Z. Um, what you said about Greece and, and um, you can't take uh, too risky uh, projects. Um, I see in your uh, press release that um, your loan impairment is just around 0.2%. Sorry? Your uh, loan impairment is only, only around 0.2%. It seems to me that's uh, rather low compared to um, commercial banks. Um, aren't you risk averse yourself? I don't. I don't know. What's uh, what's your opinion about that? I hear that sometimes, and I'm really worried about that misunderstanding because, in particular, over the last uh, three years, the risk inclination has considerably. Uh, increase. If you go at the, the number, the percentage of business partners with low ratings, it has increased significantly over the last couple of years. Maybe Mr. Trömer can give some, some figures more precisely on that, or Mr. Kerecheta. So this is not the point. The, the job of the bank is not to avoid risks. The job of the bank is to check risks carefully, not to be surprised by bad developments, and to cover risks well. So risk management is the name of the game, not general risk avoidance or risk aversion. And I think we have lived up to that. Now, of course, with the Juncker plan, we are entering a territory where for private investors, the risk might seem to be as too high. And with the uh, first loss peace guarantee provided by the EU budget, there might be a risk mitigator in the game which we believe will encourage private investors to go into investments that they normally would consider too, too risky. So, no, I don't think that uh, we have a, a problem with risk on the risk management. We are obviously doing a good job. Otherwise, we, have, we would have higher impairments. And on the risk attitude, uh, I think we are just checking our projects very well and then manage the risk well. Klaus, do you have any figures on the question of... Uh, more risky business partners that we had in the last years. Uh, thank you, President. Um, we can obviously pick up the numbers in detail. However, if you look at the average riskiness of the new transactions done by the EIB in the last two to three years, in particular last year, versus the average riskiness of the portfolio, let's say at the end of 2012, one can, depending on what measure you choose, look at a 30, 40, or 50 percent increase in the riskiness of the individual transaction. I think, President, one also needs to take into account the type of portfolio. We are not a retail lender, and we have large individual customers, and the normal rule is 90 days overdue. The bank does not wait 90 days before starting to take actions and getting in contact with its clients which makes it a lot easier for us to ensure that a client who may have been late um, for some reason, particularly most of the case technical, has paid within the 90 days. It also has to do with the type of our business. You cannot follow up the individual car loan the same way as you will finance the large loans that we have. And we have our, our head of risk here in the room if you want to follow up maybe afterwards. Thank you. Thank you, Klaus. Question down there. Hi, uh, Frederick Rohart from the Belgian Daily Leco. Uh, you mentioned for the Juncker, uh, for the the investment plan, uh, about 2,000 potential uh, investment projects. Were you aware of all of these projects, or did you discover some new uh, new projects there? And first thing, and second thing, is there a, a risk because you you are working with the the Euro European Commission, is there a risk for the independence of the, the EIB uh, in the, the management of these projects? I think we have this risk under control, and I insist on that, because the approval stamp of the EIB with its enormous, not <coughs> only financial, but also technical expertise, is normally the confidence-building measure for private investors. This is key, and this makes this bank really unique. I was surprised myself when I came to this bank to see all these first-class engineers and natural, natural scientists and whatever have you, economists, who are uh, running the project department uh, directorate and, and other important parts of the bank. So others look at us if, 
if we consider a project viable and sustainable, then others follow. And we must preserve that confidence of other investors and our entire environment. So uh, we will reject any proposal that would politicize decision-making processes for or against projects. Now, this is the one thing. Uh, the other thing is that with the Juncker plan, we are going to have an EU guarantee for parts of the risk of projects. And that means we are tapping the EU budget. And I have been parliamentarian for 25 years, and that's the, the royal right of parliaments to talk about, decide about budgets. So there is the need to be accountable vis-a-vis -vis the legislator, the budget authority, which is, in the case of the European Union, the dual situation of council and, and parliament. And the EU Commission, as the trustee for EU budget money, <coughs> must be accountable and responsible vis-a-vis -vis council and parliament when it comes to budget. Therefore, the use of an EU guarantee must be scrutinized by a committee which has the confidence and the trust of council and parliament, uh, council and, and, and commission, in particular also the commission, because the commission here is going into risk, so to speak. But this then should be targeted at the question, is a project eligible for a guarantee? While the technical check of the project, the economic viability check of the project, remains with the bank. And that must be, <coughs> that must remain intact, otherwise the investors uh, would be on, on our back. And on the investors, I can tell you, uh, in view of the in enormous liquidity on the markets in, in the world, there is a huge interest in projects in Europe, all the way up to infrastructure projects, which might have a relatively low interest rate return, but which are considered safe and reliable. And with the approval stamp of the EU bank, they normally are considered uh, reliable and safe. So I, I'm not worried about the attraction of private capital as long as we keep the integrity of the bank. There's a question down there on the left. Good morning. Um, first question. Yes. I think I missed the first question. The list projects. The list uh, projects. Well, of course you find uh, uh, old relatives on, on the... Uh, on, on these pr uh, lists or projects that you have seen before and you say, come, come on, this is probably not going to work in the future. Uh, you see standard project products or projects which uh, we would have considered financing anyway as a bank, need not necessarily have an EU budget guarantee. And you, have, you see projects which really surprise you because they are new and they're entering new territory. What I do not see, to be quite honest, is enough private sector projects. And there is a structural problem in there because these lists are a little bit too public for private companies who are very ambitious in research and development. So a private company who is entering a new field of uh, industrial activity uh, and wants to increase uh, the, the research activities and development activities, would not go on the internet telling the, the competitors uh, where they are in terms of uh, new developments. So we have to find a way in order to make sure that also these very interesting, innovative activities of the private sector can have an access to the, uh, uh, to the EU budget guarantee. We, have, we are having regularly fascinating projects in the screening process of the bank and in the decision-making pro process of the board of directors. Projects which are really scientifically arriving at new grounds. And uh, we can certainly finance more of that because uh, with the Juncker plan, a part of the risk absorption can be done by the, by the EU budget. And this is very, very promising. But you, you must find a way to open this list more to uh, private sector activities. Last word. We are presently uh, having these first looks at these roughly 2,000 projects, which is very difficult. But for the time being, we are looking at first glance uh, with two lenses in our glasses. 
The number one is obvious quality. And second, speed. For the time being, we are interested in looking at projects which we can show to the European public soon, and which we can show to the European Parliament, the Commission and Council soon, in order to say we are not just inventing a new mega infrastructure project which will then probably be realized by 2025 or later. Uh, this is nice, but it has to be done in parallel. We need projects which are going to be visible soon and which will reach the table of ECOFIN already in the second quarter of 2015. Good, uh, good morning, Emanuele Bonini, uh, EU News. Um, you mentioned the um, competitive, uh, the, the innovation gap. Um, I would like to know if does it mean we need uh, uh, an innovation plan uh, to be uh, put in place together with uh, the uh, Mr. Juncker's investment plan, or are you confident Juncker's plan could be enough to fill this gap on innovation? Thanks. Certainly not. It is certainly not enough. We need much more. I'm always a little bit worried when I he hear about these huge plans which cover everything and then go into detail and prescribe the researchers what to, uh, what to research into. So uh, I'm, I'm cautious on that. But we certainly need a new beginning with European uh, innovation activities. And uh, if you look at the individual member states, you find very, very diverging figures there, and you see exactly where the weaknesses are. But there are member states who do similar things <coughs> on their scale, which Mr. Juncker is doing on the European scale. For instance, with the Repubblica Italiana, we have come to an agreement of reserving I don't know exact figures, roughly 100 billion uh, budget guarantee from the, from the national budget <coughs> as a basis for guarantees for loans that we as EU bank give to Italian SMEs which are very innovative, very ambitious in their research and development activities. We believe that we can multiply considerably, probably by a factor of 10 or so, uh, these um, 100 million budget funds to 1 billion uh, loans for innovative SMEs. So this is an idea that must permeate all our thinking in, in Europe. And um, Mr. Juncker, and I praise him for that, is making a, a very courageous effort in this shift from, from grants to loans or from subsidies to guarantees. But he cannot do that alone. It must be done by the member states and by everybody who can contribute to the reduction of red tape in Europe. Diego Velasquez, Luxembourger Wort. Uh, you mentioned the need for more people regarding the work ahead. Uh, can you give any figures on the human resource level on how many people might come to the EIB in the following month? months? Well, uh, no, I cannot because that would not be serious. Uh, you have <coughs> to go very, very deeply into the projects we are talking about, uh, the size of the projects the uh, riskiness of the project, the complexity, all this is going to contribute to the, the calculation of the additional personnel needs. Uh, it will be a couple of hundred more people, there is no question about that, but being more precise, whether we are more around 300 or 500, it's really not, I don't want to, to show a pseudo precision that I criticize elsewhere. So it would not be, would not be con so, and I don't want to shock the, the, the shareholders of the bank. but. Uh, it is a significant thing, and uh, we are going to uh, have problems in finding these people. We have seen that uh, the European Central Bank has taken care of the market uh, very well when they employed so many new experts in, in, in Frankfurt. And uh, it, is, it is a market where you don't go for just for, 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 for very, very, very new comers uh, just leaving university. You also go for experienced people with high specialization. And this recruiting process is a considerable burden. There's some requests for questions also from colleagues who have already asked questions. I'm going to give priority to people who haven't. So if you haven't asked a question, you want to ask a question, perhaps so you can after after the next one, you can you have your chance. Please. Uh, hello, um, just here. Lewis Crofts with MLEX. Um, you talked about the bureaucracy and the red tape that can get in the way of disbursement of these of the Juncker Plan funds. Um, 
To what extent are you still concerned that state aid law and state aid reviews is going to limit um, limit that? And if it is, uh, what's the solution? Well, state aid is an important issue because uh, it's one of the, the key ingredients of competition law in, in Europe and has to be taken very seriously. And uh, the EU bank is certainly not the right place to argue against competition. So we are very careful. On the other hand, we have uh, had a an, an difference of opinion uh, over a couple of years and to which led to a, a dispute last year with uh, Commissioner Almunia, and we settled that dispute with, a, with an agreement on state aid and our participation in, in this policy. Uh, and that was uh, presented to the public, I think, in, in June last year. And I think if we all stick to that, then we will not have a state aid problem with the Juncker plan. If, however, the, uh, the, the, the width of uh, application, applicability of state aid rules to much more and much more key sectors of, of, of European industry uh, and development, then we might be in trouble. So it has to be discussed very carefully with the Commission, uh, fully respecting the competition needs, but at the same time also avoiding unnecessary obstacles in the way. So I think with the, uh, with the agreement between Ms. Amunia and myself of last year, we would be on the right track. Yeah, if I may, on EFCI, sorry, for maybe this is a very simple question, but what actual, what's going to be the value added of it? I mean, com in comparison to uh, EIB, wouldn't it be it's simply easier to increase the capitals of EIB instead of you know creating the wholly new vehicle? I mean, what could could you mention any type of investments that can't be financed by EIB but could be financed by uh, EFSI? Thank you. Well, of course, we have been thinking about that. And uh, three years ago, uh, when I was uh, due at the bank and was confronted with the situation that the bank would now turn pro-cyclical because the, the balance sheet needs were such that we had to become pro-cyclical, we then went to the, to the shareholders and said, look at the liquidity situation uh, in the markets and the balance sheet. And if, we, if you expect us to do more in lending, then we need to strengthen the balance sheet that is, that means capital injection. And they, they followed that. I'm very grateful for that. Today we have a different situation. Today we have a situation that the market is full of liquidity. Private investors are swimming in liquidity. I, I've talked to insurance companies who don't know where to put their treasury assets. And therefore we have a different situation. We need to find ways how to attract these investors into financing risky projects, really risky projects. And we can do so by setting up portfolios with an appropriate risk mix, where also high risk products can, a project can be incorporated while mitigating the, the <coughs> risk via a budget guarantee. So this is why we believe the, the paradigm change in the use of the budget from subsidies to guarantees from from grants to loans is the right way uh, therefore i believe that we can not only reach projects which otherwise might not be financeable we also need we also reach new financiers for these projects because we find investors which uh, we help to uh, do some serious uh, business with their assets uh, without uh, going too risky this is the idea. The value added is in the, it's not only the risk question, it's of course also very long maturities which the commercial banks don't provide or so. But uh, this, this mix makes it uh, possible to reach new projects and new investors financing, financing these projects. Chris, you want to have a go? It's coming. <clears throat> Uh, two more questions. One uh, on uh, the state aid issue that has already been addressed, but uh, to what extent could that cloud your speed lens uh, in trying to you know, fund certain projects? How, to, how worried are you that, that, that this could that this state aid issue uh, 
would, would, would cloud your speed lens and slow it down. And the other is a, a, also in the speed lens is, is transparency. That's been an issue in the past. Uh, I know you're dealing with it. Uh, how are you dealing with that now to make sure that, that you know, even if you're trying to speed up these projects, you're remaining as transparent as possible? I believe on transparency, we are second to none. You can follow everything we're doing on the internet. Uh, so we have nothing to hide, but we have the one issue which we must uh, have a close look at from a realistic uh, business point of view and research point of view. I, I've discussed this issue not only with businesses who are very ambitious in, in developing new project, products or new production processes. I discuss it also with uh, research institutes in Europe. They are worried, of course, that uh, some of their funding via Horizon 2020 grants might disappear, and they want to be reassured that uh, they, f on, they, they w will be compensated or overcompensated on the, on, the, uh, on the loan trail, which is sometimes then a difficult thing to achieve because of the legal status of these institutions. So it's a very, very complicated issue which we must, must address. And in these talks, the, uh, the research-oriented businesses or institutions, <coughs> institutes, told me that uh, uh, when it comes to transparency, we are ready to do everything we can, with the exception of putting our research results onto the internet, because that is going to be sent to our competitors in the European Union, in the US, in Korea, in China immediately. So it goes without saying that we don't do it. This is the key tr transparency issue. Beyond that, I think we, our record is clean on transparency. On speed and state aid, of course, I'm worried. But I think we have to uh, strike a balance here. Uh, the observation of, uh, of competition rules is key in this union of law. This is a community of law. And therefore, we have to stick to it. On the other hand, we have to uh, try to convince the regulators. And we have to convince the uh, Margrethe Vestia and her teams uh, that uh, it is in their interest to come up with state aid de decisions very quickly, because otherwise we might prolong processes which, if uh, responded to positively, can bring a considerable progress in competitiveness of, of Europe quickly. So uh, there is a balance we must, uh, we must achieve, and I hope that uh, our very solid uh, discussions with the, with the EU, EU Commission will continue on that path. Okay, we're gently approaching the end of our time. Um, are there any more questions? Last chance? Okay, well in that case, thank you very much and have a great day. Thank you.